EDTA and EGTA, both of these are chelators. That means they can keep metals away. So what's the big difference anyway? And when do you use what? And how do they work? Well, long story short, these are both chelators, which means that they are metal biters and they can hide, um, like bite down on metals. Chelate means claw. So they have these claws, they bite down on these metals and they hide them from things. So these can be like proteases, so protein chewers and nucleases like DNA and RNA chewers, which is why they're really, really useful in the lab when we want to protect the proteins and the DNA that we're working with. And they also have like medical implications being used to treat lead poisoning and things like that. We use EDTA uh, more commonly. EGTA, however, has a higher preference for calcium, a much higher preference for calcium than it has for magnesium. And this can be really, really helpful in situations where you have like physiological type conditions where there's a big excess of magnesium over calcium. And so if you were to use something with a lower selectivity for the calcium, then you would have to add a lot, a lot, a lot of it in order to get those little like calcium that are hiding out in the big sea of magnesium. Um, so it can be helpful when you really, really care about the calcium to get rid of it, um, to use EGTA. And then you don't have to worry about like adding huge amounts. EGTA can also come in handy if you're studying a protein that is maybe a metalloprotein that uses a metal like magnesium, or maybe it uses iron or something like that. And you want to be able to protect um, those and use this magnesium using enzyme with, but still be able to get rid of calcium. Um, so EGTA is very, very helpful um, in those situations. So let's talk more about how these, um, how these chelators work. So they take advantage of kind of the nature of metals. Metals are really, really awesome. Um, and that's why like proteases and nucleases think so, um, as do a ton of other enzymes. So lots of these different enzymes, so these reaction speeder uppers, these are typically proteins, sometimes protein RNA mixtures, sometimes like plexus, sometimes just RNA alone. They're able to help speed up or what we call catalyze reactions. Um, when they catalyze it, they'll be able, be able to use over and over and over. And one of the ways that they can catalyze reactions um, is by like helping hold things in place and also being able to like give and take electrons, help with this transfer of electrons, which are these negatively charged particles. So electrons, metals turn out to be really, really good at this. So these enzymes are able to use metals to their advantage in order to help catalyze um, reactions based on these electron transfers. And their metals can also help out in other ways. But the reason why metals are so good at this is because they have these kind of like large diffuse electron clouds. So if you think about atoms, um, everything from hydrogens, carbons, nitrogens, oxygens, and metals like magnesium and calcium and iron, these are all made up of smaller parts, subatomic particles. So we have protons, which are positively charged, neutrons, which are neutral, and electrons, which are negatively charged. Now the protons and the neutrons, they hang out in this dense central core called the nucleus. And then they're surrounded by this cloud of electrons. I like to think of these electrons as kind of like dogs and the protons in the nucleus kind of like a dog walker. So the dog walker is trying to hold on to all of the different dogs that it's walking. And the dogs, the really highly energetic dogs, the ones that are going to be really pulling on their leash and trying to get away, these are like the valence electrons, the electrons that are farthest away from the nucleus. They feel that pull less. When we talk about like the periodic table of elements, we're gonna find metals on the left side of the table. As you go across the periodic table of elements, you add protons to that nucleus. So you're increasing the pulling power. You have more dog walkers or a stronger dog walker. Whereas if you go down the periodic table, now you're adding a shell of electrons. So you're adding like a whole nother level of dogs. So you have lots and lots of dogs. Um, when it comes to metals, they're on the left. So they have fewer of those protons so they have less of a tight hold on um, on those outer electrons. So much so that metals are kind of like, if you were to, more like a dog park, that like some of the valence electrons, it's kind of more like a dog park than like individual dog walkers. And this is why metals can help conduct electricity, which is the movement of um, like charge. And so basically when you have like metals in these metal bonds and things, then some of the electrons can kind of flow throughout. Well, what happens is that you have, because you have this kind of like diffuse environment of the metal and it's kind of hearing less what's actually happening on that outside in the dog park. Like if a couple other dogs just like 
jump in there, like people might not even notice. Or if a couple dogs leave, people not the dog walkers might not even notice. So metals are really good at giving and taking electrons, and they can form what are called coordinate covalent compounds. They form these bonds where, so typically with a bond, what happens is you have one partner is going to share one electron, and then the other partner is going to share another electron, um, and so it's kind of like these dogs one dog is gonna go sniff the other dog and then the owners meet and they decide to get married. What happens in one of these coordinate covalent bonds is that one of the dog walkers, like two of the dogs from that dog walker are gonna go um, hang out with that other dog walker. Um, and so one of the atoms is donating two electrons. And so what happens is that if you have an atom with a lone pair of electrons that are able to do this, such as an oxygen or a nitrogen, they're able to donate those pair of electrons and thereby make a bite on the metal. If you have multiple of these atoms that can take these bites, then you have a molecule that is polydentate and it acts as a good chelator because it's able to bind down on the metal in multiple places. And so when we have one of these molecules like EDTA, or EGTA that has these oxygens and nitrogens perfectly arranged so that they can take lots of bites down on that metal, they're able to serve as a chelator. And they're able to bind really strongly to that metal such that it doesn't get used by the other enzymes that would normally be wanting to use them. And so this is why it's really, really helpful if to use if such a, a chelator such as this if we're wanting to hide metals from other um, from other sorts of molecules. And so it's really, really useful in the lab, especially in those cases where we're trying to keep things away, um, like nucleases. And so when you think about like TAE buffer, that's trist acetate EDTA. Um, and so this is a common buffer that we use when we're running nucleic acid gels to separate um, DNA or RNA pieces by size, um, or TBE, trisborate EDTA. In both of these cases, the EDTA is going to help keep those nucleases away. Um, and then in other cases, we might add EGTA or use EGTA instead of just EDTA. Um, and both of these have various uses in the lab, and so you might see both of these. So both calcium and magnesium hang out as divalent cations. So that means they're positively charged particles that have a charge of plus two. Um, and so EGTA and stuff, can it can also do some trivalent um, cations, such as some like iron it. Um, complex iron cations. Um, but typically when we're thinking about things like magnesium and calcium, these are going to be in that divalent two plus state. But they're not identical. So the calcium is going to, it's further down on the periodic table, which means it's got more electrons, it's got more shells, and so it's going to have a bigger cloud. It's going to be bigger, and the magnesium is going to be smaller. So if we go back to that idea of kind of like the claw, if you think about it kind of like one of those arcade games where you have a claw, the EGTA, it has like an expanded backbone, and this way it's like a bigger claw. And so the, it's going to be really good for holding the calcium, but the magnesium is going to be too small. So it's like trying to pick up one of those smaller toys with the bigger claw. Um, that's not closing all the way. So that's not going to be helpful, but it's really good at get, grabbing that calcium. And so you have this bigger difference between the calcium and the magnesium. Whereas the EDTA, it can grab both of them, but it doesn't have that, um, it doesn't have, like the magnesium isn't going to be too small for it. Um, and so the calcium really fits really nicely with the EGTA, but the magnesium doesn't. Um, and I'm guessing there's some flexibility that allows it, the EDTA, to be able to bind both of them, even though it's, like, different. Um, but yeah, so if you want, to, you care more about calcium, the EGTA is the way. So EDTA and EGTA, so EGTA, remember, it's going to have a higher affinity for calcium. They actually both have a higher affinity for calcium, but it's really the difference in the affinity. It's the relative affinity for calcium versus like magnesium. So with EGTA, you have a much higher um, preference for calcium versus magnesium, whereas in the case of EDTA, it still prefers the calcium a little bit, but not a lot. And so that way it's going to, like, if there's magnesium around, because there's so much more magnesium around, it's more likely to bump into the magnesium and therefore it's more likely to take the magnesium. And the calcium isn't going to be able to compete. There's such a little bit of calcium and this affinity is not like, big enough that it's like, if the calcium binds, it's gonna like keep out the magnesium really, really well or anything. So it's not able to like push it out.
Um, but in the case of EGTA, there was a much bigger preference for the calcium than the magnesium. And so this makes it so that we can get that small amount of calcium um, other, rather than the, um, even though there's a lot of magnesium around. There are also other calcium chelators that are based off of EGTA, and these can serve as really, really good dyes. They have like fluorescent dyes that bind to calcium and then like change their absorbance or like give off light in some way that allows you to measure the amount of calcium. And this can be really, really helpful because calcium has important signaling roles, especially in things like neurology. Your neurons, so the, your brain cells, like use calcium in order to help signal with one another. There are various signals in your cells that take place with with the release of calcium from like internal stores. So various uses why it might be useful to measure calcium. And if you were to use something more like EDTA, that wouldn't be really helpful because then it's gonna be showing you all of these different method metals, whereas you want something that's specific for the calcium. An example is dysbaptin. Um, so Rogers Chen, if that name sounds familiar to you, he won the Nobel Prize for like developing GFP, green fluorescent protein as like this tool. I mean, he also did a bunch with fluorescent calcium signaling or um, measurements, um, sensors, not sensors, that's what I'm thinking of. And so this is a really great article. It's, it's an old one from like 1980, um, but it goes into some of the details about how EGTA binds to things um, and various, various things. Um, and so I'll link to it. It's really, really interesting. Another really great... Uh, guide and source resources is like chelation chemistry guide from Dow. Uh, it goes over various things about the protonation states. So you can see that this is like this disodium hydrogen, dihydrogen ethyldiamine tetraacetate. Um, this is like the, um, the main form that comes into play. And you can see that these nitrogens in the backbone, these can protonate. And so at a too low of a pH, then these can actually get protonated and then it will prevent the, prevent it from taking, binding to the metal because the protons are bound there instead. And so one of the things that is Chen's doing in this paper is trying to get um, chelators that are not as pH dependent. Um, also, it goes over some of the various ways that re of reporting on the values, the preferences for various compounds. Um, so this this here is like this table of stability constants for different chelators. So you can see EDTAs here and um, EGTA is here, um, so sometimes it goes by GEDTA. Um, and so if you look here, we go down to magnesium. So you can see magnesium, so there's like a five here. And then if we go up to calcium, we see here's an 11. And if we go over to EDTA, we see 6.4 and 5.46. So you can see that the there's still a slight preference for calcium in the EPTA, but it's much smaller preference. And it is prefers it like it's it's binding of calcium is weaker than the binding of the GEDTA. So of the EGTA um, a little. And so these numbers might not seem that different, but when we're talking about like thermodynamic type stuff, little tiny differences, because there's all the sorts of logs and stuff, little differences can have a really, really, can mean a really, really big um, difference. Um, so this is just an interesting thing too. You can see the different chelators and their, um, their relative affinities for various different, um, various different metals. And then you can also see in this paper, they don't have EGTA, but they have EBTA. Um, and you can see the effects of the pH. So at a lower pH, you're going to have a um, quick drop off in the affinity for the calcium, for example. I'm planning to do a post on um, like how you prepare stock solutions of them. But just a key thing to know is that if you're trying to prepare a stock solution of one of these with the EDTA, you probably want to start with the disodium salt. It's going to dissolve easier. And with both of these cases, you're going to have to add base in order to add 
get it to dissolve. Um, and so typically these come, um, they have these carboxylic acid groups. And so an acid can like deprotonate. So when they're in their acidic form, they have their protons. And when they have their protons, then the water's not going to want to hang out with it because they're not going to be negatively charged. When they deprotonate, they get rid of those protons. Now they're negatively charged and the water likes them more. In order to get them to deprotonate, we need to add the base um, to cause it to be more alkaline um, and help pull off those protons. And then and it will dissolve better. Um, so if you're having trouble dissolving them, that's probably why um, you need to add that base. And make sure that you know that if you're using one of the salt forms so that it already has like a couple of them deprotonated, then it is useful to, um, or yeah, that makes it easier to dissolve. And, but you also wanna make sure that when you're, whatever you're using, you're using the right molecular weight because when it has those salts, it's going to be a different molecular weight than if it doesn't have the salts. Um, and you might also be wondering why not use just like the full salt version, like the tetrasodium um, acetate. And that's because it's gonna have like a super high pH. So we don't wanna deprotonate all the groups, just some of them.